Welcome back. We're very, very excited to have you back for part two of the Team Eurich Cycle Cart Design Series. If this is the first video you've watched, make sure you check out our introduction videos and part one of the design series. Like and subscribe down below. Give us a like and give us a thumbs up. Check us out on Instagram and Facebook. Now, I'm sure some of you will be groaning at the over-design or over-engineering and performance focus in this series, but I really love this bit and I find it super fun. This build represents me and is not meant to take away anything from those who have come before me. I just wanna do my own thing and share my journey. Okay, enough of that. So in part one, we looked at the rules and the overall concept layout. I did speak at length about steering geometry and effort. And in this video, I'll put numbers to my design. So in this part, we will be looking at vehicle dynamics and the powertrain. Under vehicle dynamics, we will be looking at high level spring rate explanation, rear geometry, rear axle sizing, front steering geometry, front inboard geometry, rockers, ride and roll rates, dynamic wheel loading and tuning sensitivity, and a look at the load cases. Then for powertrain, a really basic look at the engine and selecting gear ratio and chain pitches. All right, let's get cracking. So I love vehicle dynamics, even though I'm not great at it. It's got so much going on and there are so many things that influence the behavior of the vehicle. But with some basic processes, enough adjustment, time and tinkering, you can get to something that works okay. But just to be clear, this is not pro motorsport good though. Because I've never built or driven a cycle cart, for the vehicle dynamics, I'll be using a lot of the Formula SAE fundamentals as the basis, and then build in enough adjustment to see what works and what doesn't. The front suspension is comparatively complex, and the rear suspension is dead simple, but massively constrains the dynamics. So before we get into the design specifics for the cycle cart, I will preface this with a general disclaimer that the process I follow is not the normal process you would go through on a clean sheet design to determine your geometry springs and rates. The decision to go with a solid rear axle drives us in a particular direction. The rear axle stiffness and roll center will be the base around which we design the rest of the dynamics, hence we start there. Normally, we would base everything on some form of tire data. It would drive the kinds of camber, load, slip angles the tires want to maximize the available grip at the tire. I don't have this, so it's all guesswork. And my expectation is that this car will have okay dynamics, but will be a reasonable foundation to build my knowledge base on. The best practice design approach is not a linear process, but an iterative loop where you revise and refine based on the outcomes of the previous design loop, starting at the tire selection. So I'm not going to do a deep dive into tires or other dynamic explanations. There are many books. Race Car Vehicle Dynamics by Milliken and Milliken is essentially a Bible. That will go into a lot more detail and I would encourage you to get yourself a copy. However, there are three main suspension concepts with respect to selecting the spring rates I want to explain before we get into our specific design, which will hopefully explain why the rear axle constrains the dynamics. So the three concepts are ride frequency, roll gradient, and total lateral load transfer distribution or TLLTD. So just some definitions before we start. I'll be using metric units and because I'm really used to spring rates in imperial units, I'll stick with that. But all else is in SI. If you're from the US or Liberia and are creating your own spreadsheets and need help with doing it in imperial units, reach out and I can help. Wheelbase is the distance from center of contact patch to center of contact patch when looking from the side of the vehicle. The track is the contact patch to contact patch looking from the front. The front and rear track widths can be different. The center of gravity is the simplified point in space that represents the position and mass of our body. The body acceleration forces act through this point. Weight distribution is the static split between the front and rear axle of the vehicle. This is due to the offset center of gravity in side view. Corner weights are the individual vertical loads on each wheel. Roll centers. So first we geometrically define it. On a double wishbone setup, it's located at the intersection of the left and right hand projected lines from the contact patch 
to each side's instantaneous center. On beam axles, it's at the lateral restraint point. So if you have a Watts linkage, it's at the center of the Watts link pivot. On a solid beam axle, it's at the center of the beam at wheel center height. So the roll center is the force coupling point between sprung and unsprung masses. It controls the amount of load transferred by the springs and geometrically through the suspension members and chassis. For a fixed center of gravity, the higher the roll center, the shorter the lever arm between the roll center and the center of gravity, which means a smaller moment is to be resisted by the springs and the lower comes with a larger moment to be reacted through the springs. Essentially, it changes the amount of elastic and geometric weight transfer. Also, roll centers above the ground create jacking forces that lift the sprung mass up from the lateral force generated at the contact patch. So this lateral force induces a moment about the instantaneous center, pushing the wheel into the ground and the sprung mass up. It can be represented in a free body diagram like this. So if you draw a vector to point at the instantaneous center using the lateral forces magnitude and angle of the instantaneous center vector, you can determine the vertical force component. This vertical component acts on the CG and jacks the sprung mass up. Front and rear roll centers are the respective axle roll centers. The roll axis is the line that joins the front and rear roll centers. If a horizontal force is applied anywhere along this axis, the sprung mass will not rotate. When calculating overall car behavior using our simplified approach, we look at the roll lever arm relative to the roll axis and car center of gravity, rather than the individual axle roll lever arms. So each of these parameters will be used in the rates explanations. They are extremely simplified calculations and they assume rigid bodies with no chassis or component deflection. The tire deflection is not considered the center of gravity is located on the vehicle's center line when looking from the front and that we have a single mass system. When looking to select spring rates, we start in the ride mode, vertical motion. And the first step is to pick a ride frequency range. Ride frequency will eventually be transformed into a spring rate. So ride frequency is the undamped natural frequency of the car in vertical motion, ride or heave. It's the rate at which a sprung mass will oscillate when it's disturbed. So lower ride frequencies have lower effective spring rates, more travel, more compliance, higher ultimate grip, but has a slower response to inputs. Essentially, with lower frequencies, the wheel motion is slower. Higher frequency rates are stiffer, have less travel, and are very responsive to inputs, but have less ultimate grip. Essentially, the wheel oscillates faster, so if you look at a small time interval, the wheel will load and unload against the road surface more times compared with a lower frequency spring. So the typical ranges of ride frequency are as follows. So half a hertz to one and a half hertz for road cars, one and a half to two and a half hertz for sedan race cars and low downforce open wheelers, and three to five hertz for high downforce cars, essentially F1 and Le Mans prototypes. To convert from a frequency to a spring rate, we just need the sprung mass at each corner of the vehicle. So the equation to calculate spring rate is sprung corner mass times natural frequency times 2 pi squared. And to convert to pounds per inch, you just multiply by 5.71. So I'd like to deal in extremes. So the two extreme cases are cycle cart and an F1 car. So cycle cart should have corner weights around 40 to 70 kilos. F1 cars between 200 and 240 kilos. So the cycle cart should be in around the 1.5 to 2.5 hertz range. So we should be looking at wheel rates between 20 pounds per inch and 110 pounds per inch. And the F1 car would be in the three to five hertz range. So we should end up between 400 and 1300 pounds per inch. Keep these numbers in mind for later. We now move to roll resistance which looks specifically at the stiffness of the car in cornering modes, e.g. roll. There is a normalized parameter similar to ride frequency for roll that is used to set roll resistance ranges. It's called the roll gradient. It's a measure of the body roll for every 1g of lateral acceleration. A lower roll gradient results in a stiffer car with less roll. It's more responsive to turning inputs but has lower mechanical grip. 
Conversely, the higher the number, the more body roll, the less responsive, but higher overall grip. So typical roll gradient ranges are 0.2 to 0.7 degrees per G for high downforce cars and one to two degree per G for sedan race cars and low downforce open wheelers. And anything above two is for road cars. We can transform the roll gradient into wheel rates and spring rates. To do this, we need the vehicle weight and the average roll lever arm length. We'll use the extreme cases in the cycle cart and an F1 car. But because of the lack of information out there, I'll just make up some plausible numbers. So we calculate the total vehicle roll stiffness by taking the total vehicle weight as a force in newtons and times it by the lever arm divided by the roll gradient. So see the table for results. In terms of roll stiffness ranges, for the F1 car we have high stiffness and on the cycle car, lower stiffness requirements. Before we can calculate each axle spring rate, we need to perform one more calculation to distribute the roll stiffness between the front and rear axle. The last thing we will look at is total lateral load transfer distribution, or LLTD, which determines the load on each axle during a steady state turn. So to determine the LLTD, we need to know the vehicle weight, track front and rear, wheelbase, total roll stiffness, roll lever arm, longitudinal and vertical center of gravity locations, and front and rear roll centers. LLTD is the relative percentage of each axle's weight transfer. The starting baseline is that the front LLTD should be at least 5% higher than the car's weight distribution. So for example, if the car has a 40% weight distribution, the front LLTD should be at least 45%. The LLTD will also vary for a number of reasons, but the aim is to get it into that ballpark and design adjustment to give yourself a balance shift. To get the axle weight transfer, we use the following equations. What's interesting to note is that inside the brackets is the calculation to see what percentage of the weight is transferred in cornering. The pink side of the equation is the elastic weight transfer part, and the geometric is in the gray. They both have components relative to the roll center and wheelbase. So if the roll center increases, so does the geometric weight transfer, and elastic decreases respectively and the opposite applies too. I would highly recommend putting together a spreadsheet for yourself to learn about the effects of each parameter. So now we need more information. Again, this is best guess, and we took the roll stiffness from the previous calculation. We used the one degree per G roll stiffness for the cycle cart and the 0.2 degree per G for the F1 car. So we take this and calculate the roll stiffness split to get an LLTD of 45% for the cycle cart and 40% for the F1 car. What's important to note here is that to get 45% LLTD at the front does not mean that you need the front roll stiffness to be the same percentage. All the parameters listed earlier affect the weight transfer, and this is important to note for later. So now we've calculated the front and rear roll stiffness numbers. We then take that roll stiffness and calculate the equivalent wheel rates. So to calculate the spring rates, it's 360 times the actual roll rate divided by pi times the track squared. We can then convert that to pounds per inch by multiplying by 5.71. So using the typical ranges, we have now created baseline spring rates to work in. One last thing, we calculated two different sets of spring rates required for the different modes. The ride rates are generally lower than the roll rates. So this is where you'd be adding anti-roll bars or some form of mode separated springing to get the rates needed for each mode. Or you just have to live with one aspect of the dynamics being compromised. So after this, you would then go to get baseline damping. But most of you building cycle carts don't do dampers, so I'll leave it there. So hopefully this has given you a brief insight into how to come up with a springing baseline for your car. And you'll also realize shortly why I added the F1 example. Righto, let's get into the cycle cart specifics. So on the rear suspension, it's dead simple. A solid rear axle and zero degrees of camber. Now, I alluded to it earlier. But because the rear suspension is a solid axle with a short roll lever arm, it tends to dominate the dynamic behavior of the entire vehicle. So until I drive it, 
there's a whole bunch of assumptions I'll be making and probably a bunch of lies I'll be presenting in this video. So just be aware. The other thing to note is that because the rear axle is locked, it will create push understeering corners. This is because in a corner, the outside wheel takes a larger arc than the inside wheel. Therefore, the outside wheel for a fixed body speed has a higher wheel rotation speed than the inside. But with a locked axle, the speeds are the same. This increased wheel speed creates a forward pushing force at the rear inside wheel and creates a moment about the center of gravity causing the car to understeer out of the corner. To remedy this, you can either add a diff or unload the inside rear wheel enough that the counteracting moment isn't enough to create understeer. I know that some cycle carts have a split rear axle, so they drive only one rear wheel and brake on the other. Whilst you don't get push understeer, having only one wheel brake or drive will create a yaw moment about the center of gravity because of this force imbalance. Imagine the left wheel drives and the right wheel brakes. So in a left hand corner, if you touch the brake or accelerator, you will get understeer. But the same configuration in a right hand corner will give you oversteer. So I'll pretty much let anyone drive this thing. And in my case, I'd prefer the understeer as it's much more predictable. Incidentally, McLaren back in 97 used this to great effect. Search McLaren third brake pedal. Okay, the reason for the rear axle dominating the dynamics are as follows. The roll center height and axle stiffness. Firstly, we will look at the roll center, which on a solid axle without lateral mechanisms such as a Watts linkage will be found on the axle line. The tire radius defines the axle and therefore the roll center height. So for a 2.5 by 17 inch tire, it is approximately 288 millimeters off the ground plane. The center of gravity is assumed to be 300 mil, just above the axle line. This is estimated and I will validate the center of gravity once it's built, but it should be about right based on FSAE cars. This creates a short roll lever arm, which lowers the elastic weight transfer and increases the geometric weight transfer on your axle. Geometric weight transfer is transferred instantaneously through the suspension members in the chassis. And elastic weight transfer is done through the spring and damper, which is slower but more controlled. I'm sure many of you have heard racing commentators talk about roll center position changes adding drive or turn. Lowering them at the rear will generally aid drive by increasing the total steady state grip, but the car will be less responsive to turning. Raising them will make the car point more as the weight transfer is instantaneous, but you will generally get less overall steady state grip. Again, note the total weight transfer is still governed by the track, wheelbase and center of gravity. This is just changing which wheel gets the load. Refer to the TLLTD explanation earlier. So the roll center is one of the parameters that changes the weight transfer distribution, speed of transfer and load path. In this configuration, you can't do much as the axle height is fixed by the tire diameter and the center of gravity is not easily moved. On the other hand, one advantage of the high roll center is the jacking force, which will aid in unloading the inside wheel to counteract the locked axle. An independent rear would fix most of these problems, but then it wouldn't be as simple. The second item is axle stiffness. With the rigid axle, it serves two purposes. It transfers torque to the wheel and acts as the entire suspension. By combining the two functions, you end up compromising the suspension spring rate to make sure it doesn't break from the applied torque from the engine or brakes. It means that the rates are generally five to 10 times higher than you'd actually want. So to establish what the rear spring rates will be, we look at some off the shelf rear axles. And in this, the main design and tuning parameters are the axle diameter and wall thickness, and the distance from the contact patch to the inboard axle bearing. These will change the spring rate of the axle. Off the shelf sizes for the rear axle are a 40 mm tube, a 25 mm tube, and a 25 mm solid bar. The distance from the contact patch to the inboard bearing can vary in practical terms from 200 mm to 320 mm. So the graph shows the effective spring rates for each axle size and spacing. The 40 mm tube is just too stiff. Ideally, the 25 mm tube would be the best with a three to 320 mm spacing, which puts us in the 1500 to 2000 pound range. 
However, for the first off build, I can buy a solid 25mm bar with a pre-machined 8mm key to the length I want for less than 100 bucks. The three 20mm spacing ended up getting a little bit too close to the engine and it made the rear chassis packaging with the brake a little bit more difficult. I've designed the back of the car with a removable engine plate so I can redo the spacing if need be. I can also still make hollow 25mm axles for now but I'm going to stick with the solid bar and a 300mm spacing. So this lands us at a 2300 pound wheel rate, which is still 10 times higher than I wanted. But you work with what you have. The forces are reacted by pillow block bearings into the chassis and lateral forces are retained via the grub screws through the inner bearing races. I'll be keeping an eye on if the axle translates axially, in which case I'll have to install some shoulders for lateral restraint. So these wheel rates and roll stiffnesses are the kinds of numbers that would suit an F1 car. Not a good start, but let's see what we can do with the front. So the front is mainly going to be a balance tool for whatever the rear wants to do, and will also help in assisting with the unloading of the inside rear tire at low cornering accelerations. Now, before we go into rates, let's get into the outboard steering geometry. My initial assumption is that motorcycle tires in this application will want some camber, but mainly for controlling excessive migration of the contact patch because of the low sidewall stiffness. It's also worth noting now that the front will have to be heavily sprung due to the rear wheel rates, so we are not expecting big travel on the front suspension from the comparatively low weight of the vehicle. Essentially, any dynamic camber change will come from the outboard steering geometry during turning. So we begin laying out the suspension at the outboard end with the steering geometry and the aim of minimizing steering effort. And we do this through low trail and scrub radius. I'm basing the trail and scrub off the last FSAE car suspension geometry I designed. Whilst that car had heavy steering, it was mainly due to the larger forces and vehicle weight. So I think it will be a good starting point for this car with lower loads. The limiting factor for scrub radius turned out to be how far I could push the bottom pickup into the wheel before it clashed with a spoke or wheel mounting face. We ended up with an 18mm scrub radius and 5 degrees of KPI. This scrub radius leads to about 0.1 kilo of feedback due to the tyre drag. There is no braking or drive forces on the front axle, so this entire force comes from tyre drag but that is to be confirmed. The combined scrub and caster effect of a vertical force ended up as three kilos into the steering in a 2G bump. The trail length is 15 mil. And because the wheels are tall and don't have massive stiffness, I put some offset into the steering axis to land at a four degree caster angle. And at max cornering, this equated to approximately six kilos of steering self-centering force. Now you need some self-centering force, Otherwise, the car is unstable in a straight line. We did test this in an FSAE car with negative caster, and it was wild. So these are good starting off points, and I will add adjustment at the lower inboard pickups to adjust the caster angle and even the KPI. So after all that talk in the last video, the steering forces on a cycle cart are inherently low because of the low body acceleration potential, the low corner weight, and no braking on the front axle. I'm still happy I did the analysis though. So now looking at wheel geometry effects. The steering induced camber change with the KPI and caster ended up at 0.068 degree of camber change per degree of steering angle. Outside wheel gain, inside wheel loss. Which means that a static camber of minus 1.5 will keep all wheels negative at the maximum steering angle. So typically you don't see high lateral loads at big steering angles. So the camber angle isn't as critical to offset the sidewall distortion at that range. For camber gain in bump, it ended up at 0.043 degrees per millimeter of travel. This was a function of setting out the chassis point and getting the roll centers to work, rather than focusing on a specific camber gain and going from there. 
given the low travel predicted and low steering angles required, negative one and a half degrees of camber will be designed in its static to offset camber losses and tire deflection, but it can be adjusted if needed. Knowing the rear roll center was so high, we designed in an adjustable front roll center that varies between 50 and 100 mil. This allows some room to shift the elastic to geometric weight transfer. So 100 mil is not the maximum height, but it is the most we can get before we start getting big roll center height changes with roll. The other unknown variable is installation stiffness of the wheel. If it deflects like crazy, then all the work we've done to control the contact patch geometrically is for nothing. The contact patch is only 50 mil wide, and with enough wheel deflection, it could be enough to make forced reversals a reality, which are nasty and can display wild and unpredictable driving characteristics. The next piece is the spring and dampers. To get the authentic 25 look, we went with a rocker front suspension. We could have gone for a direct acting or push pull rod setup to get better motion ratios, but we just wanted to keep the look of the 25. So this decision resulted in a really crap motion ratio of 0.56, which means that for every mil of wheel travel, the damper only travels 0.56 of a mil, and it's on a slight rising rate. Whilst it might not seem bad, it does have a force multiplier. So for every one kilo of wheel force, it's 1.78 kilos of spring force. It means you need larger spring rates to even get a small wheel rate. And the wheel rate is the effective spring rate of the suspension. Essentially, because of the lever arm on the rocker, a 2,000 pound spring will be effectively a 631 pound spring at the wheel where it will take 630 pounds to lift the wheel one inch but the spring will still see 2,000 pounds to move it an inch so that's where the force multiplier comes in that load at the damper also has to be reacted into the chassis which will add weight to keep the stiffness high so it's big forces and small displacements and if your damper is of high quality like my Alibaba special and this can be a problem. They have a propensity to overheat, and this leads to regressive damping, which can make the car start to bounce. But the rear is undamped, so it's probably not an issue. I eventually want to upgrade to a set of double adjustable shocks once I get going to see if the dampers actually make a difference. So off the shelf, you can buy springs at 1,000, 1,250, 1,500, and 2,000 pounds per inch. This results in a 316, 395, 473, and 631 pound wheel rate. Because the rear is so stiff, this end needs to be bloody stiff as well. Ay 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 ay. So to get a motion ratio closer to one, the pickup point on the rocker needs to extend further into the footwell or the pivot point further away from the chassis, or we increase the angle, all with their own issues. For now it's 0.56, but it's definitely an area of focus once I've built the chassis and I can prototype some wishbones to confirm clearances. Righto, now we have some numbers. So let's look at how our car stacks up compared to the baselines we created in the original explanations. We start with the parameters that will keep constant. So there's weight, weight distribution, center of gravity, track, and wheelbase. Then we have four parameters we can vary. So there's wheel rates and roll centers. The ones I've listed, we will treat as our baseline. This is the adjustment range we have available to us based on the work we have just completed. Okay, there's lots going on here. But varying the parameters and looking at the LLTD, roll gradient and ride frequencies show that the rear axle stiffness determines the car dynamics and varying it gives you the biggest change in LLTD. There should be a difference between LLTD and front roll stiffness percentage, but because of the rear it saturates the effect of everything else. Also compared with the benchmarks of 5% higher LLTD than weight distribution, a roll gradient of 1 degree per G and ride frequencies around 2 Hz, we're on the stiff side. We will do one more round of playing around with some parameter sweeps to validate if these ranges will be okay or not. The final thing we will look at is the sensitivity of various parameters to unloading the inside rear wheel to avoid push understeer during corner entry. What we are looking at is the effect that each of our adjustment parameters has on the relative loading of the inside rear wheel compared to the outside rear wheel. We want the inside tire to have a maximum of 25% of the rear axle load. This is roughly what I used to aim for on FSAE cars with lockers to minimize the push understeer effect. So looking at the graphs, you get the biggest effect by narrowing the rear track, lowering the front spring rate and front roll center height. Intuitively, a lower front LLTD means more rear axle weight transfer, 
which means less force on the inside rear wheel in cornering. So at least that resets our LLTD baseline. And now this gives us a decent starting point to be able to mix and match parameters to find what works during driving. What this does bring up though, is that the chassis torsional stiffness is extremely important. The chassis should be much stiffer than the suspension springs, so you don't get the springs in series effect. However, now the chassis could end up being a single main suspension spring. A half decent space frame will have a hub to hub stiffness between 1000 and 1500 Newton meters per degree. And the latter frames normally seen in cycle cart would be at a guess around the 200 mark. And the suspension roll stiffness we've calculated is between 2000 and four and a half thousand newton meters per degree so it looks like the chassis is going to be a big undamped non-linear rate spring so in summary solid rear end very stiff whole car needs to be very stiff it'll be very responsive and the tires will work hard if the chassis is stiff enough so let's see how this goes at least the steering won't be super heavy next we'll quickly look at the design load cases so we want this car to be safe reliable and fun to make sure the parts won't break, a conservative load case is developed, which represent the worst case loads. Using these, we will be able to correctly size components. The load cases are derived from the wheel loads of the contact patch in different operating modes, which can then be easily transposed into the relevant suspension or chassis members, which can determine the specific loading and stiffness. Given I have zero idea around the ultimate car performance, I will take a conservative view on weight including driver, center of gravity, tire coefficients, and body acceleration potential. We then build on these using engine torque, gear ratios, braking torque, etc. to get a further level of specific loading. So this is just the tire contact patch vertical loads after weight transfer times the coefficient of friction to get the lateral or longitudinal forces. When doing the component design, add the safety factor there, then at the load cases, as we have a tendency to add safety factor to safety factor, and the load cases grow to the point where you're building and designing a tank. Right, we're at the bit most of you will be least impressed with in terms of what I do. Engines to me are black boxes. Fuel and air in, torque, CO2 and water out. If I can keep it that simple, I'm grateful. So for cycle cut, the guidelines are clear on the powertrain. Honda GX200, and a Comet TAV2-30 CVT. Now, there isn't a more fitting engine to my black box wishes than a GX200 engine. It is a perfect little self-contained box of torque, and that's the way I like it. There isn't much to say here, except it has six and a half horsepower and 12.3 Newton meters of torque. It's a pull start, has an engine governor, which I will leave in place, and it's very simple in its construction. There are a lot of upgrades out there for these engines, but I'm keeping it stock. We'll drop it in and worry about the fancy stuff later. I will say this though, the 25 with the Climax engine did have sweet twin pipes, so that'll definitely be the first mod I make to the engine after any throttle changes. The transmission is prescriptive in the guidelines, the Comet TAV2-30 CVT, and it bolts right up to the Honda engine. The CVT varies the output ratio from 2.7 to 1 to 0.9 to 1 across the engine speed range. I haven't had the engine and CVT under load, so I'm still not clear on the relationship between engine RPM and CVT output ratio. So for a basis, I'll assume the output ratio varies linearly between 1000 and 3500 RPM. So the CVT supports 35, 41, and 420 pitch sprockets and there are quite a few different options out there for tooth count. There are also different springs and preloads that can be adjusted for speed or torque on the CVT but for the time being it will remain as I bought it. There are a lot of sprocket sizes and pitches off the shelf. For me trying to keep the rear compact is important so selecting the smallest final drive sprocket is key. We also need the least number of teeth possible on the CVT output sprocket which so far I've found is a 10 tooth in a 420 pitch and a 12 tooth in a 35 pitch. To select the pitch and sprocket, we set a max speed range between 70 kilometers an hour and 100 kilometers an hour. So this puts us into the drive ratio range of four to one up to six to one. The table shown is the drive ratios and speed ranges for different final sprocket combinations using the smallest available front sprocket in the 420 and 35 pitch range. If we look at achieving, say, a 5 to 1 ratio, we end up with a 50 tooth on the 420 and a 60 tooth in a 35 pitch. Looking at final drive diameters, the 50 tooth sprocket is 202 mil and the 60 tooth is 180 mil in diameter. Trying to keep everything tight, even this small difference will help. So we'll select the 35 pitch chain, 
and protect to allow for a 70 tooth sprocket to be fitted. We can still fit a 420 pitch sprocket, but only if we have repeated chain failures. We also want to see if we can make or buy an 8, 9 or 10 tooth 35 pitch front sprocket. Everything will be on single 8mm keys for simplicity, and as I'm not chasing torque, the 35 pitch chain and single key will be suitable for the applied loads, but I'll still keep an eye out on wear and compliance in the keys. Finally, one of the hardest lessons that we learned during FSAE was the need for reliable and positive chain tensioning. So on cycle carts, the most common way is to put the engine on slide blocks and move the engine and lock it down at the right chain tension. So on a 35 pitch chain, there is realistically only four and a half mil of position change to get to the nearest whole link length. Given this small adjustment range, I'll instead be putting shims behind the pillow block bearings to have positive adjustment on the chain tension. It does increase the wheelbase and induce a little bit more bending into the chassis, but for the sakes of simplicity, I much prefer this solution. Righto, that's it. End of part two. Hopefully it's been useful. Like and subscribe below, and if you have any questions or I've made a mistake, shoot it in the comments below, or drop me a line on Instagram or Facebook at Team Urich. So part three is the final part where we will cover the driver controls, the structures, and the bodywork. So it's been a pleasure, and until next time, hooroo!